there is a God. And I am not God. God is with me, God is within me, but God is not me. Those are the prayers, the daily prayers, the monks of St. Sebastian's Monastery recite every morning at 4 a.m. See, prayer doesn't just connect us to God, it connects us to ourselves also. It's not just a place for God to reveal God's self to us, it's a place where God reveals who we are to us also, for we only know who we are in relation to who God is. We know who we are not in relation to who God is. At the beginning of every 12-step meeting, everyone goes around the room and introduces themselves. Hello, my name is Sally and I'm an alcoholic. Every week. Why? Because the moment they forget that they're alcoholics, they believe that that could be the very moment they begin to drink again. When we pray, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name, we, we too confess that there is a God and I am not that God. Because the day we stop confessing that, the day that we forget, may very well be the day that we begin to act like gods ourselves. Prayer is a great many things, but it is also a spiritual practice of remembering that we are finite human beings, somehow mysteriously connected to an infinite God. We are finite human beings who depend on this God, not just for our flourishing, but for our survival and that we depend on one another too. And this inter interdependence is uh, what's being hinted at at the heart of the prayer, give us this day our daily bread. When traveling to preach or teach in those days, Jesus' disciples were dependent on the charity of the church on other believers. If you're one of Jesus' followers traveling in Israel and Samaria or to the ends of the world to make disciples as he commanded, then give us this day our daily bread is a prayer that you'll find a Christian in the town to which you travel who is willing to feed you and house you to give you a place to lay your head and food to fill your belly. And you have to trust that you'll find one each and every time you set out on the road to tra travel. Each trip, an act of faith, a journey of exercising faith, uh, not just in God, but faith in Christ's church too. And this isn't the only time daily bread shows up in the Hebrew uh, stories. In the Exodus experience, after Moses had gone into Egypt and uh, proclaimed release of the prisoners there, that the Hebrew slaves be set free, they traveled through the wilderness, through the desert, toward the promised land. And in the story, God sends a strange substance, substance that gathers each morning on the ground like dewdrops. Then they called this substance manna, which literally means. What is it? And when they gathered this substance up, it could be worked and molded and baked into a bread-like substance that was sweet and had a little hint of honey flavor. See, in the Exodus experience, God provides daily bread directly. In the Lord's Prayer, God provides daily bread indirectly through the church. It's an interesting progression. And the church understood this. After Jesus' death, the church organized itself to provide daily bread for the widows and orphans in the New Testament book of Acts. They understood not only what it meant to pray for daily bread, they understood that it required something of them also. One of the things that we've talked about doing here, I don't know if it'll work or not, there are some really good 
questions about food safety in the process, but I'm sure you've seen some of those outdoor pantries where people can walk by and grab something without having to come in and be able to save a little bit of their dignity. We have a lot of high school students that walk through this parking lot on their way to school. And we know in Oklahoma, one in four Oklahoma children experiences hunger. We know that one in five children in America is growing up in poverty. No other demographic is more likely to be affected by poverty than children. We have friends who teach at the school who keep food in their offices and snacks to give to the kids that they know are hungry, that we're already working with, that we're already sending food for, and we're working on dreaming up new ways to get food into the bellies of those students. Because some need the prayer for daily bread to be answered today, even as many of us grow more disconnected from that prayer. I don't need to pray each day for literal daily bread. I have a loaf in my pantry until I realize that I've let mold gather on it and it has to be thrown out. If we take a weekend trip to Dallas, we don't rely on Christians in Dallas to feed us and house us in most cases. We have money and fast food is easily accessible and cheap-ish. It used to be a lot cheaper. When we pray for daily bread, it's symbolic, right? Not literal. And that is one significant difference between you and I and the original audience. We have become godlike in our ability to make food available and cheap-ish in this country. And this is a great thing. It is human imagination, cooperation, and organization at its very best. But something is lost for so much that is gained. And that something, I think, is a diminishing sense that the world is a mystical place where the Spirit of God is present in mysterious ways, but powerful ways. Some Instances we have replaced wonder with trucking schedules and divine mystery with grocery stores. We need not go to a faith healer because we have doctors and nurses trained in the sciences. And thank God we do. All good things as humanity grows and matures. As a whole, we value human life today despite what it may appear in some corners. We value human life more today than ever before in human history. But in an, an inevitable effect, thanks, <laughs> of our advancement is what Brian McLaren calls the demystification of our world. Even Christians are perfectly capable of living through our day our lives as if there is no God, he explains. As long as the system works, the roads are paved, the trucks are on time, the fields and facilities where our food is grown and packaged are in operation, as long as there are enough doctors and nurses and hospital beds to keep the system working. But in recent years, we've learned that our systems are more fragile than we once imagined, and that we may be only pretending at godlike power. We too are not immune to shortages and empty shelves where baby formula used to be. And we've learned that the same systems that are so good to make cheap food accessible to the hungry across our nation often at the exact same time rely on the exploitation of other people in poverty in order to do so. When I was in Kenya, I toured a dull fruit packaging plant where day laborers were paid a dollar a day to ship fruit to Europe, waged nowhere close to being enough to live on. 
impoverished Kenyans making one dollar a day working for an American company that sells Kenyan resources abroad that at prices Kenyans can't afford and Dole made 6.5 billion dollar gross uh, net, sorry, net profit last year doing it. And Kenya is a predominantly Christian nation. When they pray, give us this day our daily bread, it, it means something different than when we recite the Lord's Prayer. Or Walmart employees working full time and still not making enough to get off welfare. Kathy was one of those employees. When her husband died of prostate cancer in 2019, even though she was uh, 63 years old, which is not old at all, she was forced back into the job market. She worked right here in Norman at the Walmart, the neighborhood Walmart on 36th and Rock Creek. And in November of 2020, she contracted COVID there. She did her, what she was supposed to do. She stayed home for 10 days, but after the 10 days were up, she still didn't feel right. She posted on Facebook that she needed help. She was running out of food and did not really feel ready to go back to work, but was in desperate need of a paycheck. Her friends uh, gathered together to provide a little, but not enough. And faced with returning to work or not paying her bills, Kathy put her Walmart uniform on and got back to it. She worked two days, an eight-hour shift each day before driving herself straight to the HealthPlex emergency room after her second shift ended. Not a minute, not a minute before it ended either. And she died three days later. The cause of death was ruled pneumonia. Kathy's is one of more than 20 funerals that I officiated in 2020, while well, Walmart's net profits doubled that year. Sometimes godlike power has devilish consequences. To my shame, I haven't thought about Kathy much since then. That was a tough year with more grief in it than I knew how to process and, well, I compartmentalized better perhaps, and I wish I had. But as I wrote this story, I mean, her, this sermon, her, her story kept coming back to me, haunting me. See, in 2020, I lived right near that Walmart. That's where we shopped. Instead of the church providing daily bread for the widow, it was the widow providing daily bread for this church pastor until she couldn't. And then she was replaced by someone who could. And my groceries stayed stocked and my stomach stayed full. Prayer is our admission that even our best intentions, that even our best inventions as individuals and groups can still have devastating consequences because we are not gods, but there is a God. There is a God who sees Kathy and all the Kathys, a God who does not forget Kathy even when I did. And when the pain of the world is overwhelming, that's the God that we pray to saying, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. It is not for us to establish the kingdom on earth. Too many have tried to do just that with dire consequences. It is not for you and I to solve the world's problems, but neither are we absolved from the work either. Muhammad is an Afghan refugee who escaped to America with his three children, his wife and his mother-in-law. I met the six of them last year when they were moving out of their two-bedroom apartment into a three-bedroom apartment. I've mentioned them to you before, I think in December. Muhammad was an interpreter 
for the U.S. forces in Afghanistan. He loves his country and he wanted the best for it. He never wanted to leave. But when news of America's withdrawal broke, he started getting death threats. And when his brother-in-law went missing, he started taking those death threats seriously. He never wanted to leave his country, but when one of the soldiers offered to fly him out, he accepted the offer eagerly for his children's safety and for their future. The first slur was hurled at his 14-year-old son in a hotel lobby the very first day, the very first day they were out of a detention center. Terrorists go home. Muhammad tried to tell the woman that he worked to defeat the terrorists. He was against them too. They were united in this. He tried to tell her and many, many people over the next year until he accepted that most people just didn't want to learn. When I met Muhammad, his family was struggling to get the U.S. Depart State Department to approve him to work in the U.S and the family was not doing well. They had no refrigerator, no beds, no books in their own language aside from the Quran. And when our friends at Mercy Outreach run uh, by the Islamic Center of Oklahoma City reached out to see if I could help them move in my pickup truck and to see if there was any assistance that our church could offer, I jumped on it. I think I've told you this before, but by the end of the day, one of you had donated a refrigerator, another one of you hopped in the car and helped me drive that refrigerator over and unload it. We went to REI and bought them the best sleeping mats we could so that they could lay them out and then pick them up during the day in such a small space. We stocked the refrigerator with all the food it could hold and gave them grocery cards to try to help them in the future. That's what I shared last time we talked about Muhammad and his family. And what's happened since then is rather remarkable. We reached out to some of our friends at Tinker that had a bigger network. And they became advocates for Muhammad to get the proper papers so that he could begin working here in America. When those papers came through, they didn't leave him to navigate the system on his own. They leaned on that network even further, helping him to find a job in which he has been excelling. See, Oklahoma received the third most Afghan refugees of any state in the nation, immediately putting a burden on Oklahoma hospitals to get more translators. And who better than Muhammad to understand the plight of these refugees, to be able to put them at ease, and to minimize the communication gap in order to get them the best care possible. Now he's able to serve his country folks here too. There is a God who is involved in the world in ways that are mysterious and strange partnering with anyone who will partner with him. We can't do it all, but we can do something. And not often. But every once in a while, we get to hear the end of the story. And let me be perfectly clear. Muhammad's story is remarkable because Muhammad is remarkable. He only needed someone to stand in the gap. And that's how I understand the church's calling. We stand in the gap between the world that is and the world that will be. Between the kingdom of God that is both now and not yet. We can't stop the kingdom's coming even if we wanted to, but if we're lucky, if we're lucky, we can be a part of it. We can be prepared for it. For his is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever. Amen.